here because that would already like be like okay I'm out I can't deal and so how can we like be in integrity on the dance floor and at festivals and really show our our relatives that this is a safe place and we will make it a safe place I know for some of my relatives it's really triggering to see people people from Europe having dreadlocks like it's we're not there yet because people are being shot by cops and we're out here in the festival scene you know people are being mass incarcerated and so like something that I would like to see and for me especially when we're talking about the UN Declaration of Indigenous Peoples Rights is how many of my peoples on the dance floor are in alignment with the UN Declaration of Indigenous Peoples Rights how many of my people on the dance floor are committed to abolish prisons to abolish detention centers to open up borders so that we can really figure out how to address climate change and um, repair the political destabilization of our relative territories around the world. And so for me, something that comes up when um, during psychedelic and sexual emergence on the dance floor is that sometimes I'm seeing people in a state of uh, historical amnesia. And something I really try to advance in my work is historical memory. And so sometimes being at festivals is really hard for me because I feel like we're in a state of uh, cognitive dissonance where we're actually just like reproducing some of the harms. And I would love to see, like I, I want to see us transcend. I trust that we can really meet our potential in the next, it's not, gonna, it's not 11 years, we have five years or less to address global climate catastrophe. Um, and so that starts by being in alignment with the goals of decolonization, with decarbonizing our economy, and that really is in alignment with, what, with how we treat ourselves and each other on the dance floor, that we're not reproducing extractive behaviors and that we're really putting in the work to transform ourselves so that we're not perpetuating extractive behaviors, but we're producing regenerative ones. And I mean, if we're gonna party, let's party hard, but let's evolve, let's like emerge into the next state of utopia that we really can, you know, take this medicine with us and carry it with us after this festival. That. Yes, more please, thank you. Yeah. So that is, thank you, first of all. Thank you for speaking to that. And may we continue to speak about it. May we speak about it amongst ourselves frequently, often. Because we all need reminders of that. I need reminders of that, thank you. Um, one beautiful way to have interactive intervention especially when you're in, um, let's say, like a sexual scenario, is to remember that consent is just respecting someone else's body sovereignty. So if you're coming from a place of respect, first of all for yourself, but also of other people, that's a good framework to look at. Um, and that something that's really helped me shift my thinking is expanding the boundaries of what I consider to be myself. Yes, I have this body vessel that I dress and move around this world and have a continuous storyline with, but this is just borrowed from the earth. We are all of the earth, we are of the elements. And when we can expand our sense of self to include the earth and to include other people, our actions suddenly become much more clear. They're if we're if we're treating each other as we would a beloved that is a good place to move from and to treat the earth you know as a beloved as well how could we ever extract from something we love so much and that's a frame that's really helped me to continue to be reminded to be in alignment with the things that i love and to support them and to support their growth and flourishing and to find that symbiosis together. Thank you, Rasma. I was, I was gonna say another way, so uh, I specialize as Ranger Raspberry. I specialize in working with people in challenging altered states of consciousness. I'm a green dot ranger, been doing it for very very long time 
and something that uh, I have a strength with is people in non or let's say not nonverbal but post-verbal <laughs> states of consciousness so this is often uh, one of the most challenging kind of situations that you might encounter people also have emotional challenging altered states of consciousness that you'll encounter as well like substances need not apply you know our our brain will produce those things you know as well you know let's say you're fighting with someone and different things like that those are also challenging but for someone in a post verbal state of consciousness to be able to help them return to a calming breath is extremely helpful and the reason i bring this up is because it's another another way to remind ourselves that we are embedded in this web of connectedness that we are not separate and our breath is a almost constant reminder of this we're always taking in what we consider to be the external and then returning into that cycle and so if you all are open to it i would love to practice a technique that i have used very very often which is an audible relaxed breath and if you encounter someone who's having a hard time you're having a hard time reaching them they're in a post verbal state this is one thing that you can do regardless of where you are out in the wilds right next to you know a speaker anywhere you know to to breathe with them and to remind them of their breath so i will demonstrate and model how to do this and you can either join me or join in we can do like an accordion style but i would love for you all to participate if you feel called um, and this is another thing too which is that we are modeling the way that we wish the world is ideally so as we walk in this world as we move in this world as we dance in this world as we play in this world as we cry in this world to model the things that we want is a really good way good way to be and especially for people in post verbal states this is this type of kind of directly brainstem mirroring is sometimes the only way to reach them you know when they're another factor to consider is to treat them as though they're an infant if someone's in a post verbal state treat them as you would like you know your your baby you know wrap them up in warm clothes if it's cold put pillows and blankets on them ground them and if it's you know hot definitely get them into the shade get them some water but the breathing with someone is such a primal soothing nervous system tonic and if you take one thing from the harm reduction pieces that i share audibly breathing in a very calm way with someone is what i pray that you walk with so i'll demonstrate it and i would love for us all to practice cuz it's edgy for some of us to audibly breathe it's not a thing that we do and so i invite you into this safe space of practice of doing that And the more relaxed that you can genuinely feel, the more that will come across to their brain stem, to their their lizard parts of their brain that they're safe. If someone in their vicinity is breathing in a calm manner and they can hear that, there's no there's no uh, that's that's a lullaby essentially. And also, I invite you to if if you're able to purr, purring is really great. Oming and sounding with people is really great. Anything that again reminds us that we are connected, that we're not alone, is how you reach people in post-verbal states, and a great methodology for harm reduction in all ways. Thank you, Rasma. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, so to continue the conversation on nonverbal and verbal cues, check-ins, um, I think that situational awareness means that we are checking in with each other and if we see something that is concerning on the dance floor, I feel like we should follow our first instinct and intuitively approach people and really work towards destigmatizing check-ins because some people are really concerned about being socially awkward if you're checking up on someone or maybe like a situation looks a little ambiguous and you're not sure if someone is having a good time. You can never go wrong for checking in with someone to ensure that everyone's having a good time. And uh, that's the phrase that I use sometimes. I'm like, are you all having a good time? And then I really work on how to read nonverbal cues, how to read body language, and to assess whether I need to continue asking some more questions to see at what degree of sobriety someone is at. Um, and something that I think helps um, is to ask people if they need to go to to give people potential exits if you sense that someone needs to exit to be that person that will be that will escort someone like do you need to go to the first aid tent do you need some water are you hungry um, do you need to go there's the Zendo project that I've heard of and so we, uh, let's talk a little bit more about that. So that's for more like, you know, if something looks ambiguous with like bodily autonomy um, and to really assess whether someone is really overexerting their bodily um, presence on someone else when they seem out of it. That's, those are some of the questions I ask. And sometimes as someone who identifies as femme, as non-binary at times, um, I ask to check in with other femme relatives or someone that I think is, um, you know, at a certain state of transcendence um, or on a different plane. And so I'm like, hey, can I talk to you for a second? I, I have a question to ask you. And I make it known to the other person. We have to have this private conversation. It's one-on-one. -on -one. Just give us a second. And no, you can't be in the conversation. It's something private. And sometimes I have to get stern about that. I did at Burning Man last summer. Um, and to really like keep asking those questions and to like offer someone like do you need another group of friends for the night? Like do you want to like just giving people options and to see if they have the capacity to make those decisions um, and then also if someone's having like if someone seems like they're past the state of being self-aware in their body something um, that is always helpful I always like so I think you were talking about like forming a circle around yes. a person yes tapping a person yeah. and you just offer some nonverbal cues some something some other phrases one can say is like you're not alone I'm here for your safety or do you feel safe right now I want to make sure you feel safe what do you need to feel safe yeah. do you need to go somewhere are you good need water again really trying to embody peace love unity respect on the dance floor by making sure we are of service so that everyone is gonna survive yeah. <laughs> um, and going off of that, there was something I wanted to continue to talk about and going off of the UN Declaration of Indigenous Peoples' Rights and also addressing DDR, and it's not Dance Dance Revolution, but close <laughs> enough, it is a revolution, um, to, uh, need to check my notes, to demobilize, disarm, and reintegrate. And it's, um, it's a term usually used in peace building uh, theory and practice and because sometimes uh, our dance floors model the way we treat the earth and the way we treat each other we can also begin to model processes of disarmament demo demobilization disarmament and reintegration and we can practice it here I you know I've been really trying to like ask myself okay so how does this begin when our planet is ravaged by war when people are profiting off of arms and we're here at festivals like I know the two are connected but how and like I, you know sometimes I fantasize about bringing the festivals and the raves in spaces of armed conflict and seeing like if that kind of culture would help with the process but then I think when I arrived on Thursday, I started to think, or no, it was Friday, yesterday. I'm like, maybe DDR does not start in the places of armed conflict, but it starts in the festivals where we are so fucking privileged to not be in territory that is ravaged by armed conflict, but once was. And so acting prayerfully and really engaging in 
the conversations and the envisioning that needs to happen here at these festivals. And so the theory of demobilization is that, and it also comes to like what happens on the dance floor. So we have to create interventions to disrupt the culture that we've been regurgitating, that we've internalized, the racism, that we've internalized, the sexism that we've internalized. We have to heal the toxic masculinity or just the toxic logic of domination and subordination that we've been fucked with for so long and we have to like practice it model it and then like extend it to the world and so demobilization means that we really start to analyze what we're invested in and we really begin to ensure that dancing and dance culture is not weaponized against some of the most marginalized peeps in this world and that we're not leaving this festival and continuing to be invested in the circumstances that keep people in some of the most grotesque unacceptable conditions on this planet um so what that looks like dun 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 <laughs> is that we start locally and that's we're in kern county Kern County is where this Trump administration wants to expand oil drilling and right now there's a battle to defend Kern County, this beautiful sacred indigenous territory that we're, we're having festivities on, is that risk of <coughs> oil drilling being expanded here. And so we really only have five years to transition justly into a renewable energy economy. And so it starts locally in California. I was also a little sad, TBH, to see that there wasn't as many people at our indigenous relatives talks as there were for other amazing people bringing justice and healing to the planet. And so when I saw that Guardians of the Forest was like, not as full as Paul Stamets. Shout out to Paul Stamets, love you. I was like, how can we like for next year, make sure that more people know that these talks are happening? Cause some people are really getting on those planes and traveling more than 20 hours to make it over here to tell us about what's up with their forests and like how our consumption is impacting the targeting of indigenous environmental activists in Brazil, in the Amazon, in Indonesia, in Guatemala, you know? So I really want us to take, you know, intervention, interactive intervention for psychedelic and sexual emergencies beyond the dance floor. Like it starts, it can start in the dance floor, but it also goes out into the real world and us showing up for our relatives, going to the front lines and being like, we're gonna make sure that this fucking UN declaration for the rights of indigenous people is gonna be enforced and upheld. That's really like, I mean, that's really how I try to dance on the dance floor. So when I'm fucking moving my booty, swaying my hips, that's I'm really praying for that and that's why I also want to be respected when I'm dancing and feeling really in my creative erotic power because I'm really praying that we really honor consultation, consent and cooperation and that we're really working towards a movement to demobilize, disarm and reintegrate. We have to heal some of the folks that are you know, participating in the harm of other folks and um, I think that was what we were also talking about is bystander behavior and like um, healing ourselves to get out of the embodied norm of of reenacting bystander behavior because it's bystander behavior it's staying silent it's not doing anything about it because we're fearful of being awkward or we're feel fearful of the consequences to ourselves to our ego that we're really not intervening to demobilize and disarm some of our most weaponized relatives that are causing so much harm to the planet and to each other so um, we really have to like be more interactive with the world we're co-creating because we can't continue to give consent to people weaponizing the land and building and expanding walls and creating open air prisons to our relatives in Gaza, to our relatives in Venezuela, to our relatives in Centro America. Like we got a lot of relatives to show up for and um, yeah, we can do it. So I mean, we can demobilize, we start it here, we demilitarize by divesting, divesting and reproducing those conditions of extraction. Please come talk to me after, I'm more than happy to share more about how we can continue doing that. I wanna, yeah, open up the floor. <laughs> oh, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In, in that similar vein, I know for myself, and I'm, please hold me accountable to this, is that with the privilege of us being here 
in this space is the acknowledgement that we are creating a new culture. And as Ismail said uh, in his talk, The Psychedelic State of the Union, this no longer will we be the alternative culture. Like we are to be the mainstream and to do so in a good way, we need to hold ourselves to a, a very high standard because so many more people are going to be enfolded into this way of being. And I know for me, like, please hold me accountable to my words. Please educate me. Please let's have these conversations. Please let's connect with each other. And again, you know, if you see something, say something, you know, let it be known that you're watching what's happening. And when it doesn't feel right, when your heart tells you, I, I need to do something about this, go forward and inquire and get to the bottom of really what's going on, even if it's someone you might not know, but something feels off, you know, you can always ask and see. And this, this applies so much, like, let's get active with each other, you know, let's, let's communicate with each other, let's support each other. And that's how we create this community of care. And through modeling that, then others learn and are given permission to be in that way. I've received a lot of feedback recently about how my self-expression on the dance floor, and I also enter into prayer and trance states very frequently, um, and in blessing, that, that my freedom of expression liberates others in their freedom of expression. So we can co-liberate each other and hold each other accountable to creating the most beautiful culture that we can dream. And I invite that. I invite those conversations and those dialogues, even if, you know, it's, it's an unfamiliar pattern to start a conversation with someone you don't know or if something feels wrong, to to experiment and to, to go into that. So thank you for speaking about that bystander bias. Um, and something, oh, um, uh, something that that made me think of is receptivity. And, you know, we're all on different parts of the spectrum of engagement at different times. And so, you know, if something that we do triggers someone, how can we also be super receptive and not feel crushed or not, you know, react immediately with an intense reaction if something triggers someone? So, like, if there's something that we're doing or there's something that we're embodying or wearing that is just not in alignment with someone, how can, you know, we, we just say thank you. Thank you for letting me know that this is how you're feeling right now. I'm going to take it into consideration. I know something that's always a point of engagement for me at festivals is when I see someone wearing a really tacky ass headdress that's trying to pass as a Native American headdress and I can't believe I'm still having this conversation in 2019 but <laughs> I saw one in 2018 at Burning Man and I had just read a really cool article by an indigenous relative Dio Gandhi write about uh, cultural appropriation at festivals, particularly Burning Man, and I was so stoked. I was like, okay, I'm not about to see this at Burning Man. Maybe everyone did their homework, read about it, la la la, but I did, and um, it was just, you know, it's always an interesting point of contention, and sometimes I enjoy engaging in this Socratic dialogue that is still in process, and I'm like, hey, like, who are your indigenous relatives? Like, what does wearing that mean to you? And like, just asking questions, like, what do you mean by that being on your head? And like, do you know that like, right now we're still dealing with the consequences of 500 years of invasion and conquest, and we have not healed from that. So you wearing that on the dance floor is totally out of context, bro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I would really love more, I mean, I've ha I have like, you know, more than five experiences at raves and festivals, definitely more than five, maybe ten, maybe more than ten, I don't know, but it's always a point of engagement, and I think something that people, that would really be empowering is for people to say thank you, like, thank you for letting me know that this is harmful to someone somewhere, like that, and, and to also practice community accountability, like, even, like, it shouldn't always have to be like the, the burden, like, 
the person who has to bring it up bear the burden of bringing it up like we should all be participating and making sure that we're making the dance floor and festivals more inclusive spaces so that one day we can get to the place where the folks who are experiencing the most violence under state violence can feel welcome to festivals and that this is a place of inclusivity um, and 